moments in civil rights half a century ago are still touching the lives of many African Americans today. Good evening, I'm Alexandra Morales. And I'm Nick Swain. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Zion Buzz. The historic march on Washington for jobs and freedom was 50 years ago. But as Zion Buzz's Rochelle Aline shows us, for one UF professor, it's a day that only seems like yesterday. We will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. 50 years ago, over 250,000 people came together in the name of equality. The historic March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom is considered to be the turning point in the civil rights movement. I had the opportunity to speak with a UF professor who was an activist during that time. We had a chance to talk about the civil rights era, the original March on Washington, and what it's been like to watch the world change over the last 50 years. Uh, it was bad really everywhere for black people. In the Midwest, the Northeast, the West Coast, we were discriminated against. But the South was really horrible. I mean, I was in Mississippi uh, for the Mississippi Summer Project of 1964, and Mississippi was the worst of all the places. And I was there for two years, and I witnessed horrible things, you know, burning of buildings, crosses, shooting in houses, people being beaten. I had every intention of going, and my church was going, there were NAACP buses, and my grandmother said, you are not going, because she believed all the hype that was being projected, that it was going to be a violent uh, confrontation, blood would be running in the streets. This is what the media was projecting. I was standing waiting for a taxi, and a white cab driver pulled up, said, taxi? Well, I knew I wasn't getting in a taxi with a white driver because that just didn't happen when I left there. So I let two or three taxis pass before a taxi being driven by a black man drove up. And I got in and I said, why are all these white? I said, where are they going to take me? And he said, oh, no, they're integrated now. And I said, you're kidding. He said, no, where you been, you know? I said, I haven't been to Mississippi for 10 years, you know. It was, I knew then that we were on our way. If Mississippi had cracked, every place was going to crack. <laughs> we gathered around the reflection pool, and I just could imagine how it was, you know, 50 years ago. We still have a long way to go. You know, Trayvon Martin reminds us of that. And I'm so glad that people realize how important what happened to him and how it was a symbol of the unfinished work of the human rights movement, because we're talking human rights, economic rights. Fifty years have come and gone since that historic day, and only time will tell where we'll be in 50 more. Reporting for Zion Buzz, Rochelle Olin. It's been 50 years since Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Half a century since African Americans set out on a quest to Washington, D.C. in search of equality. Zion Buzz reporter Nikkel Smith reports on how the University of Florida's Association of Black Alumni approached a quest of its own during this year's Black Alumni Weekend. Celebrating dreams fulfilled. That was the theme for this year's Association of Black Alumni Weekend. We wanted it to be an opportunity for us to reflect on the legacy of Dr. King, but at the same time celebrate those things that have uh, come to fruition for us. Like recognizing UF's first black graduate from the College of Medicine, who now reflects on his own experiences 50 years ago. I was involved in, in some of those at Florida and m uh, being arrested and all of that because of uh, you know, civil rights uh, demonstrations. So it sort of brought back some of those uh, memories and uh, uh, I saw the, uh, 
the march on Washington is, uh, I guess, is a sort of a, a validation of some of the things that the students were doing uh, in so many uh, uh, campuses. Seeing and hearing uh, those people tell their stories and their experiences dating back almost 50 years, and now seeing, you know, watching them look out in the audience and seeing young alumni who don't have to go through the things they went through. So they can say, yes, it was a tough time, but we opened the doors for others to follow. ABA members like Dr. Cotman don't want students nowadays to forget what their predecessors went through. The campus now is, uh, I find it's quite accommodating and, and quite friendly and uh, hospitable. And, uh, you know, in past years it wasn't, it wasn't that way. I think we still have a long way to go, but I'm starting to feel uh, more like a gator. ABA has goals of bridging the gap between black alumni of all ages. We've got to engage more with current students so that they understand our mission. They know we exist and they know that the ABA is their rightful place when they graduate to come and be a part of this and, and give back to the university and certainly the students. One way ABA has started reaching out to recent grads is through the recent establishment of a young alumni committee. Reporting for Zion Buzz, I'm Nikkel Smith. The University of Florida's Black Student Union was established in 1968, 10 years after the school became integrated. At that time, it didn't have anywhere near its current average of nearly 300 students attending general body meetings. In this episode of Zion Buzz, we're putting the spotlight on a student dedicating his time to make USBSU a home for its members. I came from a predominantly black high school, so immediately when I got to UF, I was kind of looking for the black people. <laughs> um, you know, I was looking for like that home away from home in a sense. Yeah, I remember me and my roommate, um, at the time we decided to go and check out the BSU me uh, meeting. Well, not my roommate, one of my best friends. So went to check it out. Um, I still remember the BSU exec board sitting in like the front row. They were giving like cabinet reports and things like that. Um, and I also just remember the rest of like the community kind of like sitting in the back. I still remember like even thinking about running for president and you know at first I was like I don't know if I should do this, you know, am I ready for this? But God told me to go for it, you know, he said that he wouldn't put anything on you that you couldn't bear and I decided to just take the opportunity. I really wanted to see a BSU meeting packed out on a consistent basis. So seeing people constantly coming, um, seeing people feeling connected, uh, you know, and not just to, to come to a social event, but to come to actually want to be a part and to hear the discussions that we have to talk about. I've encountered so many people where I'm like, come to a BSU meeting, and they're like, I don't like BSU. They didn't treat me right freshman year, or you know, everyone gossips, or you know, I don't, I don't know if everybody has stank attitudes, or you know, those where the bougie black people hang out. You have to either get five vertical, horizontal, or diagonal. It definitely is um, a lot of work, you know, um, but I'm passionate about it. Um, I get a chance to oversee seven cabinets, four subcommittees, and two suborganizations, and put a smile on my face while doing it. Um, I get a chance to help shape and mold leaders. And I feel like that's one of the best opportunities that you can have as an undergraduate student going into your senior year, the chance to like help students discover what they're passionate about and to help students realize why their culture is important. We get a chance to bring that, that sense of black excellence, black leadership and black scholarship. So getting a chance to promote academic excellence, getting a chance to promote all the things that we like from music to forums, discussions, to um, just topics about life that we're interested in talking about. I honestly see BSU um, continuing to grow. Um, this year has really inspired me and I think that the next reign of people who are going to be in the elected official positions are going to be amazing. To let the students know is that anything is possible um, because I feel like sometimes as student leaders you know we we may doubt ourselves or we may think that something isn't 
isn't really possible or we can't really accomplish it all in like a year's timing. But if you put your hand to the plow, as they say, and you, you, know, you get people behind you, you, you create a dedicated team to help you out, it's pretty much possible. Be sure to check out these upcoming events around campus. UF's Institute of Black Culture has gotten a makeover this semester after first opening its doors back in the early 1970s. Ever since then, it's been offering many services for students ranging from printing to being just a place to hang out. But for some students, the IBC has become even more. I think the IBC is essential for students in the black community at UF. It honestly allows us to feel like we have a place to call our own and to feel like we have a position here at a predominantly white institute. Nick, now you know I love me some Hispanic culture, especially <laughs> since my family is from Puerto Rico, so I'm really excited about this next story. Well, I mean, what's not to be excited about? We're talking about food, yes. music, culture, all that. People all across the nation have been celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month. That's right, Nick. And Zion Buzz reporter Peter Gay Sherwood brings us the story of one local Latin band that has brought the festivities right to our backyard. Over the past month, many people from all backgrounds have been celebrating Latin culture and history here in North Central Florida. Salsa, bachata, and flamenco are just a few dances that got fans off their feet with local band Tropics. According to Laura de Cascabera, Latin music is a mix of different rhythms. And music is a central part of, of our culture. In Puerto Rico, we have rhythms that are influenced from both our, our Spanish ancestry and our African ancestry. And then we have some of the instruments which are from our indigenous um, peoples, the Taino Indians that were there before anyone else was. Here at the Bo Diddley Community Plaza Free Fridays concert series, the Latin flair is in the air and has just about everyone enjoying themselves with family and friends. As you can see, there's lots of people here because the concert is free and open to the public. The family-based band likes to bring their music and culture that is full of energy to the community. We're very full of life and you can tell that by the music we play, by the dancing that we do. We have a lot of energy. We're really, we're a very happy people. To find out more about events happening at Bodily Community Plaza, visit gvlculturalaffairs.org. Peter Gay Sherwood, Zion Buzz. Hearing that music just makes me want to bust out and do some salsa from here. Okay. <laughs> well, that'll do it for the very first episode of Zion Buzz. Be sure to submit your story tips to GatorNABJ at gmail.com with Zion Buzz in the subject line. Thanks for joining us. I'm Nick Swain. And I'm Alexandra Morales. This web show is a part of UFNABJ Zion Magazine and can be found at UFNABJ.org. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on Zion Buzz.